I think we have fabulous people all over, you know, in the world and in our hearts and imagination that we, don't, we often don't kind of contact or really appreciate what they've done for us. So I guess I'm, I'm going to make this a fairly quick or speedy presentation and to think or to add some ideas about um, people have, who have really changed the world very sort of, I don't know, surreptitiously and easily. So what's happening here? Does someone want to give me a hand? Who's the person drinking? What's the person drinking? That's right. And so why are the pe and why is he not um, crying, but all the other people around him are? I guess because uh, he's Socrates, and Socrates actually um, was sentenced to death because. He was corrupting the minds of children. I was actually one sentenced for that same <laughs> offence. <laughs> and I'm going, to come, I, I'm going to sort of mention that very briefly later on. And you'll see that his wife, she's bursting into tears and leaving. And I think that's Plato. But really the thing is that um, Athens wanted to kill him. He was sentenced to that a, a sentence of death. But he didn't really have to go through that sentence if he didn't want to, because the rich guy down with the robe had already bribed the guards. He could have left and gone somewhere else. But of course, being Socrates, he wanted to drink the uh, hemlock because he felt that if the state had let him go on preaching and, and he did it and enjoyed it, then he must allow himself to be killed by the state. And so he drank the hemlock. I don't know how many people in the world have drunk hemlock, probably hideous, but to me, he's just somebody that, that I look up to. And how many people in the world do we know like that? Well, yes, there's a few more. Does anyone know who this is? This is a bit harder. Come on. Hippocrates. Was that, is it Hippocrates or is it... Um, any other ideas from my daughter? Okay, well, <laughs> this picture is fantastic because he, a person that Hippocrates healed is now giving him back some gold. But he, he rejects the gold because he doesn't practice medicine that way. Does anyone have any stories about Hippocrates at all? What do you know of him more than that? Yeah, and what about the Hippoc Hippocratic Oath? The thing is, pardon? Do it exactly. Thank you very much. To do no harm. And he would only go into the house of somebody who needed help with their permission and would only work on that patient. These days, there is no such thing of a Hippocratic Oath like that. It doesn't exist. The corporations won't let a, you know, They've, they've tried to disappear it. So he is one of my uh, heroes. Angelica? Uh, I noticed you. You had the other, yep, that one. Yeah, we, we got the same, so I won't even mention that. Um, the other guy, Sir Francis, why has he changed history? Why has he kind of given us something that we wouldn't have had otherwise? Well, didn't he really uh, preach to the birds? and the wolves, and went barefooted, and never, never spent money. So what I'm suggesting here is not that I'm a brilliant kind of instructor about these people, but to say we need people like that continually to keep us charged up and to learn from them. So they're some of my favourites. I want to now move on to paradigm shifts. <laughs> Boy, huh? Rock and roll. Uh, paperback books, driving movies, the pill, protesting the war in Vietnam, smoking pot. Anyone here, were they involved in that? <laughs> <laughs> I've always loved, I really, I used to love drive-ins too. I won't uh, bore you with that. Uh, next one, darling. Okay. 
This is now the very early 60s in Australia, and the people are protesting on the left. You know who, okay, does anyone here know what this particular protest movement is about? Yes, that actually the government had wanted to get rid of Utzon because they thought he cost too much money. This is, so Utzon is the person who built, you know, the opera house that you see right down there at Benelong Point in Australia. But the interesting thing is these were, these were guys short back and sides and it was the first protest that I ever witnessed in Australia. So because of all this other earlier stuff about uh, sex, drugs and rock, people, the, the world was changing very quickly. So some of the people who were there were also there on the right-hand illustration. In fact, if anyone knows who Tarek Ali is, you'll see him hobbing the limelight down there at the bottom. So what was, what was going on in the world at that time was youth was breaking out. And they did that at the older master marches. They did it here. They did it, what's the next one? Uh, you're supposed to speed it up. Was anyone there, did, did anyone was doing that stuff in America? Did anyone march in that particular event? It was so horrible. This, a beautiful example of trying to twist, a per, you know, ex explain that there was something deeper than just endless war. Now in about, I'm not trying not to, uh, promote myself at all, but a magazine um, called Oz began in Sydney in 1963, and at about the same time that uh, the underground press started uh, happening in Berkeley and the and, and uh, New York. Can you go back a bit just for a sec? Oh no, you're going nowhere. Okay, so this magazine Oz that was published in its very first issue, and the, and the three of us who were involved in well, you can see what we're doing to a very, very important uh, bastion of humanity, uh, was sent to jail, okay? And so they three jailed uh, filthy paper. Next one. The Vietnam War, do any of you remember it? <laughs> okay, were any of you there? Maybe, maybe some of you are. So that's a guy called LBJ, well, all the way with LBJ, and that was our... Prime Minister. Come on, so Robert Menzies, anyone heard of that? Yeah, right. Well, nothing's really changed. After, so we know Oz, Oz did pretty well and then it moved to London, and my friend Martin Sharp, the day that that guy shot the Vietnamese man, Martin poured uh, you know, bloodstains all over that particular magazine. So suddenly, again, youth was kind of drawing its strength from its own curiosity and beginning to understand that terrible things were going on. Uh, and it wasn't all just blokes, blokes, blokes. That's, uh, you know, there's plenty of kind of wild, exciting times in London. That's Jenny Key. Who's the lady up on the top corner? Right. Is she here today? <laughs> Would you like her? Would you be scared? Yeah. yeah? Um, now, it was actually, where's uh, John? You got me into this. Yes. John said, oh, just do something about your life a bit. Didn't you? And, and because we went to jail and stuff. So I've, I, I'm doing this very quickly. I'm a pretty ashamed of it, almost bored by it. But uh, we'll just go and have a very quick look on first one. So that's the three of us. God, I'm handsome. Uh, but the one on the right made all the money. And then the next one, well, that's what happened to, you know, first of all, you, you feel wonderful, next you're in jail. And what's the next one, Di? I hate that one. But the, um, <laughs> that's, the, um, that's the cops laughing at the very magazine that was being prosecuted and for which we went to jail. Next one. And I like this power. Uh, we had our detractors. And, you'll, and uh, of course, uh, the Beatles uh, loved us. Keep going. Quickly, we'll just do this quickly. These are fires around the Old Bailey of London. Final acquittal. God, I'm gorgeous. Onwards. <laughs> yeah. Still. And that was a magazine. Okay. Next one. 
Let's go on to a more serious note. Um, okay, they, <coughs> yeah, I've completely changed my whole script. But um, this, again, always reminds me of Rachel Carson, The Silent Spring. Don't you think she is, she's a fantastic heroine, one of the first people to uh, bring that to our consciousness? And I, every time I see those two images, um, it reminds me how much work there is still to be done. Next one. Okay. I want to ask you something. Um, are we entering another paradigm, or did we long ago? Because I wanted to... One little note here. Uh, I reckon that not, not only are we entering another paradigm, but also we've got to kind of embrace or respect all the fantastic hot enthusiasm there is now for healing the planet. It's happening in this room, happening out of it. And we have to ask ourselves, really, all this hot enthusiasm that is for healing the planet where does it really come from? Eating whole, whole foods, chemicals, working with nature, developing the self. Where does it come from? Well, it comes from the hippies. It comes from all of us here that have, that have dabbled in that. And I don't think uh, they've been sufficiently acknowledged. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get, come on. Hey. There, yeah, right. Okay, now we get down to some uh, more serious stuff. Are you happy, John, now? Yeah, okay, that's good. Um, I love this cartoon. Who did it? Who, who drew that? Did I hear it loud and clear? Robert Crumb. Robert Crumb, thank you. And this was a very, very early 70s. Do you want to look at those, like, those three different ones? Which one is the most likely to come true, do you think? You know, that you hope. I know you're all hippies <laughs> down here. But still, because of one, my own incredible sadness, the, the vision at the top is really frightening because it's a, it's a kind of a military, um, I don't know, it's just a destructive image and that it seems to be also putting its place into our world with more and more, in fact, you said the drones and so forth, that, that, that just seemed frightening. What, what's in the middle what's happening? Just the Jetsons? Okay. In the corporate world, maybe, or life. Next one, Don. Next one. Okay. The future. Pretty frightening, don't you reckon? Is that is what is going to happen to the rest of the, the living world? And will it have to be... I know I used to live at uh, Taronga Zoo Park and uh, we had, you know, kind of fences like that. Is this kind of beautiful, glorious estate, will they, or will they start being... Um, fenced for the rest of their life. Do you feel sympathetic about that? I mean, do you feel angry? Do you think it's inevitable? Or do you think it's impossible? Does anyone relate to that picture? What's going on? Well, I'll give you a clue. It's um, Tim Flannery. I like Tim Flannery, but what Tim says is that the best option is to pump sulphur into the stratosphere. This would filter the sun's rays, slow down global warming, and turn the sky yellow. I was reading this, and I thought, I really like him, but he's gone crazy ape bonkers. <laughs> Don't you reckon? But he's talking about, yeah. Um, putting stuff in, in, through the, uh, 
well, through the sky, and that's the end of the sky. Next one, Dial. And there's a lot of people coming up with geoengineering, this sort of idea that we can be rescued by incredible genius and, you know, uh, perhaps you know, corporate style. And is it going to be, is it going to lead us anywhere? Do any of you feel hopeful or excited by these visions? Not particularly? Okay. Next one. How about these? In future, alternative energy overtakes fossil fuels. Greenback is withdrawn as world currency. Landline services abandoned. Some will hate that, some will love it. Coal-fired uh, power plants shut down to save the Greenland ice sheet. Spirituality for dummies. Are we all reading that? Okay. Next one. Okay, getting down to the more serious stuff. It's Plato, actually, who said there should, there should exist among the citizens of the world either extreme poverty or excessive wealth, for both are productive of great evil. That was in about, nine, uh, I don't know, nine, uh, 1974. We've all looked out of the window from parties like that. But what do we ever discover out of that window? That's my kind of dilemma. That's what poverty looks like, the one on the screen. Give us the next one, Tootsie. This, I think, is really shameful. I wish I had the small print, but he's actually has just crawled off a makeshift boat. Well, and he's, and the, the pic picnickers aren't taking any notice of him. And he's relaxing in the tropical, yeah, they're relaxing in the tropical paradise of the Spanish Canary Island while he's setting off to a, a new world that none of us will ever kind of imagine or know what happened. Next one. Okay, this is a, uh, a, a tender subject. How the Rich Are Screwing Up the Earth. It was written by a Frenchman called Hervé Kempf. Not published anywhere in Australia or as America, as I see. But how do we handle instances like this? Um, what's... No, just back for a sec. In that, does anyone know what that uh, building is on the right-hand side? Do you have any... Have a guess. Yeah, and who built it? You, you know. You named it? Are you pleased? No, um, the beautiful, once American owner of the hotels. Yeah. Was it Trump? Yeah. Okay. Um, and the rich. Now, this is what I want to, to mention about Hervé Kemp, the guy. The, weary, the wealthy have all the economic and political power and they are very happy with things that way. We cannot understand the intertwined ecological and social crises if we don't see them as the two sides of the same disaster. A disaster that comes from a system piloted by a dominant social strata that has no drive other than greed, no ideal other than conservatism, and no dream other than technology. This predatory oligarchy is the main agent of the global crisis. I'm not asking you to shove that down your throat, but we're getting more and more people waking up to the uh, disparities. Is that the next one? Yeah. I think that puts it extremely well. Okay, a little bit of fish stuff. To talk about. Any you been to um, Key West lately? No? You know, look like Key West people. Well, we'll just do this very quickly and it should be self, I shouldn't even have to say a word. What's the date of that one, Torch? That was Key West 1957. Uh, what's going on there? Great big fish being killed. Next one. 
1980. Have you noticed any difference? Yeah. And the next one. How amazing. Well, you see stuff like that and you just want to curl up in the fetal position and drink cocoa. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that one. Isn't that fabulous? I really love it. Let's all go, <laughs> let's all go sailing. Okay, the next one, little thing there. Next one. Oh, okay. Now we're on the kind of controversial stuff. Um, do, do you remember this? What was it called? The Matrix. Okay. Next one. Do you remember that? So that was a Vietnam War and uh, the My Lai Massacre. And when uh, US soldiers blew away hundreds of people in a Vietnamese village, most of them children, only one of the 26 war criminals were ever prosecuted. William Kelly, and that was actually, yes, only one, and that was William Kelly, and he was pardoned by President Nixon. Next image. Who in this room has seen that image before? I'm seeing five people over there, you're not sure, uh, on one or two. What do you think it is? Come on, you know, it's a rendition. Um, why have so few people seen it? Thank you very much, you got me out of that spot. Yeah. It's, complete, it's an almost forbidden picture, and it's not the only one. What's the next one? That's completely disgusting. Uh, Australians were involved in the bombing of Fallujah, and, and they're just thrown away completely. Um, and now Fallujah and a lot of these other places that w were bombed in um, Iraq, only five, my God, it's, I'm just warming up. Um, the, it, it's, it's completely unknown for most of us what is really happening as opposed to what's in the papers and what other people are saying. Next one. So I will ask you to think about um, why is it that thing, terrible things happen and we don't know about it? And I go back a bit actually to they thought was reality. And at one point in time, the sun and the all the beautiful beings in the world at that time. And the duty of that person was to come back and tell his fellow inmates. And of course, when he went back to tell them, they just said he was mad and he became a madman. And I think we are entering a situation now that a lot of, there's an incredible lot of stuff that is hidden from us. And what we're really seeing is nothing but crap basically. And how do we fight against that? Put in poor old... Now, what an incredible uh, image that is. Bradley Manning and Shaw, the laughter down the bottom after the, uh, you know, the, the, the attack on uh, Baghdadians by the helicopters. And you're thinking, this guy's going to jail. This guy's going to be, you know, he's in an incredibly serious situation. And you say to yourself, God, it's a, you know, it's just a pity he didn't go and, you know, shoot, some, shoot people. That's what he would have been uh, ad respected for. And it's, what is it about our society that it's like that? Next one. The New West. Torture, renditions, killer drones secret prisons, secret courts, assassinations, farewell, habeas corpus. Uh, one, uh, next one. Were any of you there at Occupy Wall Street? Would have you liked to have been there? Could have you changed things? Could have we all gotten out of the cave and into the kind of bizarre, hopeful extravagance of those events? 
Wall Street demonstrators jailed for protesting, Wall Street bankers jailed for destroying the world economy. Next one. I just want to say this. <laughs> Is that all right? <laughs> I'll go now. I, I really muddled it tonight, but uh, I enjoyed it nevertheless. Uh, <laughs> Paradigm shift is hopeful. So now, in, you know, in current evaluation, finance is everything. But in, a, in, in what may or may not be a new Jerusalem, it's the planet that will be at the core of everything. I think that's an interesting kind of slide. We know about WikiLeaks. You can just do that quickly. And I've got two more things to say. All over the place, you bumping to people these days, and not just from our country and America and other countries, where things are happening. Like this guy, a um, guy called Mark, is, is no, is, is, he lives without money. That's what it is. He, he eats nettles. He just straight, uh, scrapes things from the ground. And of course, he's having an amazing life. He'll probably end up selling, you know, selling a novel and making a fortune. But nevertheless... <laughs> and then the other one is... Uh, no impact man. I bet that's going to end up as a novel, probably. But at least these, I mean, all the people in this room are sort of in a way, way ahead, but there's this other kind of groundswell of people knowing instinctively uh, that something is seriously wrong and that we have to kind of uh, grasp this while we can. So I've only got two more things to say. Is, well, they... <laughs> Two more things. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we are locked in a race between self-destruction and self-discovery. Perhaps the only way humankind can solve the planetary problems we are facing is if we can also make some psychological breakthroughs so we can stop thinking about life as every man and woman for themselves and become a lot more cooperative, self-aware and open-minded. And finally... I dedicate the last slide um, to the future, which is you're going to press the button. Okay. Thank you very much for your time. Let's hope we all get those people.